thank you for having us. Uh, really excited to be here. My and pleasure. I will jump uh, right into it. Um, this is a slide I've showed too often the last couple of years. Um, and as I mentioned, value has been written off time, many times before, um, but never as, as intensively as the last couple of years. Now, we've experienced the longest anti-value cycle since 2007. And up to 2017, there was 10 years of underperformance for value investors. Then the two tough years of investors came because the mega stocks, the mega cap stocks, the Apple and Tesla and Microsoft dominated the market. And this was followed by COVID. And what we've seen is, especially during the COVID year, COVID year and a half now, there's a tremendous exuberance by market participants. What we mean by that is that the essence why value works is the human behavior and in most particular human emotions when faced with uncertainty or stress situations, uh, we don't do or we don't make good financial decisions. Uh, we make good decisions to survive. This is what our evolution has showed us. But it's very incredible to see that the market decides which companies will survive extremely fast and give them tremendous valuations and the same simultaneously uh, give up on names very quickly, meaning they're extrapolating current events too far to the future, too fast on the positive and negative side. And what we've been left with is that currently we see the market in a bifurcation. Sorry, that. No, we don't. There we go. That pockets of the market in a tech segment, we see similarity to the dot-com crisis where valuations are extremely high, meaning there's extreme expectations. But with good performance, the hurdles don't become lower, they become higher, and they're priced for perfection. And we as value investors are looking for things where there's room or margin of safety or room for error. And we also see quality companies trading at tremendous multiples, which we haven't seen in many, many decades. And we see this market currently offers you a tremendously good starting point for value investors to start doing the analysis. Now, the next chapter, we will look at some multiples and some of the underperformance of value and give you some insights. We have first want to show you the MSI world value versus growth for the last 20 plus years. Now, we've seen these graphs in different shapes and forms today. I think one thing to highlight is that value and the start of the 20th century outperformed up to 250 percent on a relative basis to growth and the last three years the underperformance was so tremendous that all of the outperformance which was created after 2007 was given up meaning that growth for the first time in history over a long period of time has beaten value and it's a very naive definition of MSA world value versus growth which splits the market in two 50 50 baskets now, there is some underlying information which is very important and we will share with you the forward PE ratios of these two baskets at three different points in time. Once at the end of 2010, then at the end of 2017, and now as of today. What you see is interesting that in 2010, um, we see that the value basket was trading at 11 times future earnings and the growth basket was trading at 14 times future earnings. This is right about here. 10 years later, or eight years later, the market was trading at 14 times for value and 20 times for growth. Now, in this period, you do see in a great shape area that value was underperforming quite significantly, but this wasn't due to multiple expansion on the growth side. There was some multiple expansion as a discount increase to 28%, but it was mostly because growth stocks on average delivered better earnings and delivered also higher growth rates in historic context. Now, in the last three years, and this is what becomes a little bit fictional, the main driver of performance for the growth basket was not the poor performance of value stocks, it was that growth stocks became extremely fast, very expensive. So since the end of 2017, value as a basket has become cheaper, despite the outlook looking much better today than three years ago, but growth stocks have an upfront of 50% of multiple expansion, which obviously for future returns is not a good um, starting point. We believe the starting point evaluation is a very good future indicator. 
Now, a different way to look at it, and this is quite more quantitative way of looking at it, we built portfolios for three different regions, for Asia Pacific, Europe, and North America, for two timeframes, 2000, 2021, so the long period, the same as just, we just showed you, and for the last three years. We built portfolios based on fundamental indicators, which you see on the right-hand side for value, momentum, quality, and growth. These are just examples. Obviously, you can get much more creative with which factor. And we're screening, based on these factors, the most attractive 20% of the universe. So for Asia-Pacific, for the time frame 2000 to 2021, you see scores from 1 to 8. One means the dividend yield for this time frame was the best indicator when compared to these eight and did deliver a significant outperformance despite value being called that. Asia Pacific, the dividend yield, or even price book were two of the best factors you could have used to outperform the market. Now, you do see growth and quality in particular, and even earnings revisions, which is part of key momentum, have underperformed to grow the market. Now, the main message is the value over a long period of time did deliver despite its last three years. If you didn't look at the 50% of the market, if you looked at the first quintile, the 20% of the market, it, you could still deliver some excess returns. Now, when we look at the last three years, this is where growth outperformed by significant margin. You see the scores one, two, and three, basically, none of them in value, all within momentum, quality, and growth. Now, not surprising because we know value underperformed by the biggest margin ever last year. And the two years before, we did basically three of the worst five years in history of value investing. And you see that value factors had no explanatory power at all in the market. We believe down the road that valuation does matter and that future growth assumptions, quality, and revisions are adjacent information, which is important to support evaluation, but don't deliver premiums or outperformance in the market. Now, to just show you some examples of how the market does change its opinion or becomes potentially overly aggressive, we want to show you two types of companies from each bucket, from the we call dot-com bucket and the Nifty 50 bucket. Now, Louis Vuitton and Microsoft, these are the we consider high quality names uh, that have a very good profitability, very strong cash flows. And we just plotted two multiples, price sales and price future earnings from 2017 to, to August 21st. Now, keep in mind that December 2017 was not a bear market. It wasn't the bottom of the market. This was already at the, the market was doing extremely well at this point in time. And you see that the multiples for Louis Vuitton and Microsoft, depending on both indications, has pretty much doubled. There's been a tremendous multiple expansion. So the market has been willing to maybe justify, maybe not, but the market fact is, is willing to pay double the multiple for businesses that have been around for a very long time. Simultaneously, we see the high growth things, Tesla and Neo, car manufacturers in the electric vehicle market, obviously there's obviously their high growth, but we do see this exuberance that something that traded three times sales, we can't show you earnings multiples because they don't have earnings multiples. Um, and if they do, they're so high that they're not reasonable at all. But you see Tesla traded three times sales, and then in last year during COVID traded up to 23 times sales, now 17 times trading at tremendous multiples. Uh, we're talking about revenues, multiple. So you basically have to wait 17, 18 years uh, on a revenue basis. Now there is growth, but the competition in electric vehicles is increasing. It's not becoming easier for Tesla to gain market share, it's becoming more difficult. So paying the highest multiple after things have gone well, we believe is very high risk taking. Now, these are just examples, but if you see in the top left-hand corner, if the title percent of US stocks trading over 10 times price to sales, it's not driven by a few names. This is driven by a broad market. Right now in the US, over 25% of stocks are trading at 10 times sales. The last time we saw such a high number of stocks trading as high multiples is the Team T bubble. It's fair to say today businesses probably on average are better than the Team T bubble. But could there be potentially so many names, and a lot of these names are actually competing against one another, 
they're trading at such high, high multiples. Historically speaking, when multiples expand too quickly, the very high probability that will come as quickly as they've gone up, they will come down again. Now, historically speaking, as the graph below, we can see the S&P 500 has delivered a real return over the last 40 years of 8.7%. Stocks trading at 10 times price and sales ratios have delivered roughly half of it. If you take into account the last three years, which obviously has been in the stocks have performed incredibly well, it used to be at 3% annualized performance for these high valuation names, so underperformed the market quite significantly. Now, we're trying to give you now in the next chapter more details surrounding these valuations and some other facts about current value portfolios. For the next few slides, the way we look at the market is we built uh, a value portfolio on a global universe, put a large cap universe, <clears throat> and using the most attractive 20% globally versus the least 20%, which we consider the growth stocks, is because they kind of have their very asymmetrical <clears throat> factors and fundamentals. We plotted the earnings yield of a value portfolio throughout time. That is the blue line on the right hand side. And we did the same thing for the growth portfolio. And what you see here is one interesting thing the value has experienced no multiple expansion dis despite the interest rate environment. But also, it's actually quite attractive in the history of time. Um, only in the heights of the GFC, the European financial crisis, or during COVID, has traded at more attractive multiples. Now, now it's trading at 10 times, basically 10% earnings yield, so 10 times earnings. Now growth, and you see in particular the last two years, has traded, become more expensive of time and took a significant uptick, um, yield going down, meaning multiple expansion, becoming very expensive. If you take the differential between these two styles, and you look at the discount or the valuation spread, so to speak, we're now looking at an almost 100 percentile last seen in differential in the TMT bubble. Now, one very important thing for value, but also growth for any style, and this is we've seen today, value stocks are deemed as that they're not growing, but the fact is also value stocks have to generate future cash flows and the businesses should, should grow in essence at any clip if possible. Now, we looked at the historic growth expectations, not the realized growth, but the expectation for growth portfolio and a value portfolio, the identical two portfolios we just saw. Interesting or not surprising is that the blue line, the value portfolio historically has less expected growth than a growth portfolio. And there's a few interesting things here. Remember between 2000 and 2007, these were the golden years for value. And you can see that the blue line is roughly trade at 10%. So even a value portfolio had growth rates of 10%. Growth, even though it had profits underperformed significantly in 2000, 2007, was growing or had an expectation of 20%. But still it had a high expectation. It still underperformed the market significantly because these expectations were not met. Since 2010, uh, we did see that the growth rates in particular for value have declined, but also for growth. So it's not the growth is not growing faster than historically. Um, and you can see that value in particular also, <coughs> excuse me, um, is growing at just above the 0% line. It's many, many years now. So the growth has been very, very low also for growth. And you can see since 2018, a huge dip down. This is when the trade war started of China in the third quarter of 2018. And you can see then COVID happening and beginning of 2020, where the growth rates expectations become very negative. Interestingly, now the blue line is on top of the red line, indicating that a value portfolio currently has higher growth expectations than a growth portfolio. This has been only the case in the TMT bubble. Uh, it's very rare. But currently, despite the huge valuation discount, which is almost at all time highs, actually growth expectations are also in favor of value, which gives you a tremendously interesting opportunity to look at these stocks, which are very attractive, but also growing at a very good growth rates. Now, we talked about expectations of growth. 
But now when we look at realized growth, and I think this is even more important than what is expected is what do we actually realize? Value stocks have the stigma that you know growth is bad, but also are they actually hitting the growth? We know growth stocks often per example, the extrapolation, the outlook becomes too positive. There's only good news. And at one point, expectations can't be met. But what is the case of value stocks? Since 2000, we have the light blue line. This is the realized EPS growth versus the estimated. And you see there's periods historically where value stocks actually surprise on the positive side, despite being attractive, in particular in the time frame between 2000 and 2007, you see the blue line for a couple of years being above the dark blue line, showing you that value stocks for a couple of years delivered very good returns. If you looked at the growth portfolio, you would see it completely reversed. Expectations were high, but growth stocks permanently under surprise, basically underwhelmed um, what was expected from them. Now, the red circles indicate when value delivered much less than expected. This is the European crisis 2011, doubled the recession 2015. And since the trade we see permanently for three years, value stocks delivered much worse returns than actually expected by the market. Since the last 18 months, value stocks have delivered again much for the last 12 months. Value stocks have delivered significantly better results than expected. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of upgrades due to the economic recovery and due to the market, but also analysts have become way too pessimistic, way too fast for value stocks. The different indication, which is very important for growth expectations, we're looking at revisions of this value portfolio and growth portfolio throughout time. This is why. The gray line is the re revision, three month EPS revisions of growth stocks, and the dark blue line is a three month EPS revisions of value stocks. Now, obviously, you would expect the line to be above zero for growth stocks, but it's not, indicating that growth stocks, the growth baskets, have such high expectations. And actually, on average, these companies struggle to meet expectations and to have upgrade revisions. Value portfolios, in particular, with the time frame 2002 to 2007, had a period of roughly five years where there's permanent upgrade revisions, which was very, very good. You had upgrade revisions between 2009 and 2010. This was the economic recovery after GFC. 2016, 17 were decent years for value. And since the end of 2020, with the vaccine in particular announcement, you see a tremendous amount of upgrade revisions, never seen before actually, that value stocks when aggregate had so many upgrade revisions, which is very positive because first, the earnings have been very strong, the earnings growth has been very good, but also they keep, the, the analysts keep taking revisions upwards, meaning it is surprising on the upside. To summarize the last couple of slides, we do see value, top and right side, value as a style, um, as a portfolio is extremely attractive on a historic basis. Growth, you see a score of seven, meaning there was only 93% of the time growth was cheaper than it's today. So it's very expensive. And a global universe, actually, from valuation, it's also fairly expensive. So value has been basically dislocated to the market. Growth expectations, we are currently in a recovery. Not surprising universe, we have very high growth expectations across the board, but value actually has never had higher growth expectations as a style. And growth actually has had periods where it grew better. So the valuation and then growth expectations don't match currently. We're looking now at quality. We didn't show a graph to it, but we'd also plot quality in historic context. And what you find, what I find very interesting is the universe. Currently, you have lots of businesses at very high margin, especially in the quality segment, if you look at Louis Vuitton or Microsoft, Apple, you have this, lots of businesses having very good quality, high margins, being very profitable, very good reinvestment rates. However, value actually delivers currently also a very good profitability, while growth has low profitability, historically it has. Obviously, growth portfolios have low profitability because Growth stocks, per definition, the value lies in the future, not in the current. But the basis, the starting point of quality is very low because a huge amount of value is for growth stocks currently in the future. 
revisions for these baskets, the universe value, the revisions have been very positive. You've seen lots of upgrades. Growth portfolio is actually currently one of the worst times, historically speaking, in the 16 percentile. So 84 percent historically have been better periods from a revisions perspective for this growth portfolio, meaning that these stocks disappoint. The hurdles are very high. And they're not able to hit those hurdles on a consistent basis. Now, we want to show you what we call transition matrix. Um, this is what we try to use to peel behind what's actually happening, happening to these stocks in these different baskets. Now, you see a lot of data. I will walk you through it and hopefully um, this will be able to be an interesting viewpoint. Through our time, um, we look at the migration of value stocks um, after a period of 12 months. So you're building a portfolio um, of the first quintile, and you have obviously have five quintiles, so to speak. And we look at how many stocks after 12 months remain in the same valuation bucket, so to speak. And for Q1, Q1, top end right now, side, the 54% indicates after 12 months, 54% of stocks remain cheap. What's interesting is that 25% go into quintile two from quintile one, 12% go into Q3 and so forth, meaning that almost 50% of stocks that were very attractive at one, after 12 months become more expensive. And this migration path for value stocks of becoming more expensive is a very, it's a value, it's a performance inducing transition because the market is giving you a higher multiple. Obviously, your earnings could drop and keep it higher because your earnings disappear. But in most of the cases, it's the multiple gets higher because the market changes its opinion. On the flip side, if you look at Q5 to 60%, expensive stocks tend to be actually more sticky. So expensive stocks stay more expensive. But if you look at them, 60%, if you go to 21% and 8%, you see 40% after 12 months migrates downwards. However, if you look at the migration path on the left-hand side, going from Q5 becoming less expensive is obviously not a performance-inducing uh, path, so to speak. And to show you the actual returns of these portfolios, you look at the, on the right-hand side, in the bottom, you see the performance of these portfolios. This is a time frame from 1999, 2017, so before the tremendous underperformance of value. So stocks that stayed in Q1 had a performance of 15%. The markets did a performance of 12.6. You see the bottom half left-hand side of that bottom right matrix right here. This is the market performance for this time frame. And stocks that stayed, so 54% of stocks stayed in the first quintile, they still outperformed the market by a significant margin. But then you see the stocks that became more expensive going to Q2, Q3, obviously a tremendous outperformance in the market. Interesting on the flip hand side, the growth portfolio, even though the stocks that stayed expensive underperformed because the valuations were just too high and doesn't matter even if they stayed expensive, they didn't perform. And going lower in the quintiles, going to Q4 or Q3, the performance was very, very bad because they become the market went from a high multiple to low multiple, and obviously that was not performance inducing. The outperformance annualized throughout the last from 2017 for these two for these portfolios, Q1, so the value stocks did 4.3 annualized outperformance in average, and Q5 underperformed the market by 2.7 percent annualized. Now the last three years where there was tremendous multiple expansion, we also analyzed. And what you see here is Q1 in particular had quite a bit of more stickiness to it. So there was less stocks in the value bucket getting more expensive. This was primarily driven because growth expectations were not met in the value side. And on the flip side, the most expensive portfolio, Q5, was also more sticky. Historically speaking, it's at 60%. Now it's at 68%. Down below, you see the performance and two very interesting things. First, the value portfolio of the stocks that did manage to get more expensive, they outperformed the market slightly. 
but the stocks that stayed underperformed the market drastically, 37% versus 30.6%. The expensive stocks in Q5 that remained in Q5 outperformed the market by an unprecedented 25% versus 13, but almost 12% annualized. Now, the Q5 Q1 performance is minus 4%, so the underperformance of the value basket has been extremely poor, an ally is minus 4% versus an outperformance for the most expensive stocks, which we don't think is sustainable because we showed you growth rates are not as good for growth portfolio and for value portfolio. And also re revisions have been quite negative, has in the last three years of 8% annualized, which has never been as bad before for value investors. Now, why do we believe that even though there's a few names that have had tremendous um, performances, Apple, for example, Amazon, we want to show you just the facts that growth rates over long periods of time are not sustainable. And what we did here is we looked at the growth distribution, earnings per share, and for sales growth over the last 40 years for one, three, five, and 10 years. So to explain the graph, the blue line here is the one-year earnings growth. The red one is three years. The gray one is five years. And the dark blue one is 10 years. Now, what you see is when long periods of time that the dark blue lines start to get on the left, on the right-hand side, you see percent of the market. And you can see that the dark blue lines become very populated in the middle basically mean reversion when it comes to earnings growth. There's very few companies that can sustain large positive growth rates or large negative growth rates, because obviously if you make too much negative growth rate, eventually it won't exist anymore. The light blue line, there's lots of names. 25% of the market historically grows at 40% plus. But fact is after three years, there's few name, plus names after five years, and there's very few names we can sustain high growth rates over long periods of time. There's a strong mean reversion. Obviously, Apple is one of the stocks that remains in this blue bucket over many, many years. To give you the message. This is the growth in sales. Obviously, the same message. Now, we've seen the last when you look at crises. Um, we just want to split. I do it quickly. When you go into a crisis, tech bubble, GFC, Corona, cyclical sectors, work which are bound to the economy, will underperform drastically. Defensive sectors will outperform. But if you look at the performance after the crisis ended, this is the three years later, you see basically that cyclical stocks will do the outperformance and defensive stocks will do the underperformance because cyclicals will get cheap during crisis. And during the recovery, the cyclical companies will outperform by significant margin while defensive stocks tend to be too expensive during uncertain times and have no more upside performance. I will skip these graphics and just conclude. Um, we believe that 13 years of anti-value cycles coupled with Corona has left the market with unprecedented valuation advantages for value investors. The economic recovery and earnings recovery for a broad-based universe of value stocks, which are unloved, has been never been stronger than today. And the market with its bifurcation of loving certain names gives you tremendous opportunity to look the other way. I think the market is very early into a value recovery. Um, we believe there's many years to come if the earnings are sustainably strong and valuations are as attractive. So we think it currently is an extremely good time for value investors going forward.